A boost converter consists of the same components as we have seen in the buck converter, but this time they are arranged in a different way. The inductor is connected to the input voltage source. The switch is then connected to ground, but again controlled from a gate source pulse signal, as we can see it down here. The shared node between the inductor and the switch is connected through the diode to the output capacitor and the load is modeled by a resistor. Similarly to the line and load regulation capabilities of linear power supplies, switch mob power supplies also can react to different conditions of the input voltage or load current requirements by the resistor. Here the variable that is changing is the duty cycle of the gate source signal. So you can modulate that to the left or to the right based on a pulse width modulation signal. The duty cycle can go down all the way to zero and can go up all the way to 100%. When the switch is turned on in a boost converter, it is short circuiting the right hand side of the inductor to ground and therefore the inductor is in parallel with the input voltage source. As this node therefore is zero volts, the diode is blocking and the capacitor is providing the current required by the load. And as that is a hardwired connection, the equivalent circuit diagram here does not change. The blocking diode can be modeled by an open in the equivalent circuit diagram. Now when the gate source voltage is zero, the switch is an open and the inductor current is forcing the diode to conduct. Therefore the diode is acting as a short circuit. The inductor current flows to the output capacitor and provides energy to the load and the circuit is closed through the return pass, which goes through the input voltage source. Taking the short circuit of the diode and the open circuit of the switch into account, we have the equivalent circuit diagram as a second order low pass filter during the off time of the switch. Again, we can have a look at the average voltage across the inductor and the average current through the capacitor. And if we solve those equations, we get the DC transfer function for the capacitor voltage as a function of the input voltage of a boost converter. And from the average capacitor current, which needs to be zero, we can derive an equation for the average inductor current as a function of the output current. Both of those DC transfer functions are 1 over 1 minus the duty cycle. Now if we plot 1 over the duty cycle, we get a hyperbolic function. Adding a minus in front of that mirrors that function on the y-axis from the first quadrant into the second quadrant. And finally, we shift the independent variable, which is the duty cycle here on the x-axis, by a factor of one to understand how the DC transfer function of one over one minus d looks like. We can see when the duty cycle is zero, the DC transfer function of the output voltage divided by the input voltage is 1. At a duty cycle of 0.5, we divide by 0.5 and that gives a DC transfer function of 2. So that means that the output voltage cannot be any lower than the input voltage in a boost converter, but can only rise with the duty cycle. Now, theoretically, that rise would go towards infinity for a duty cycle approaching 1. Practically, the assumption behind the derivation of those transfer functions are not fulfilled anymore as soon as we reach duty cycles of approximately 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 
And furthermore, we would have voltage drops across the parasitics of the components, for example, the forward voltage of the diode, and eventually the transfer function would actually return down to zero. We can understand that in the way that the inductor has no time anymore to release the energy of its magnetic field to the capacitor if we reach a duty cycle of 100% because the inductor would only be in parallel to the input voltage source but never be connected to the output. Therefore, the capacitor or the output side would discharge through the load and the output voltage would drop to zero. 